This is a story about the Atlanta gay rights movement in the 70s, and I had two main characters. One of them was an interesting guy who's no longer with us. The person I'm going to read about, though, became the most famous female personator in the country in 1978. And this is the beginning of his story. John Greenwell could stay in Huntsville and be called the town queer, or he could run away and be free, so he ran. He threw a couple of days' worth of clothes in a cheap gray briefcase that he'd had since high school, he counted $11 in his wallet, each one worn down like him. He flew out of the house that he had never really called a home. He left in a whirlwind. He'd never run away before. Home had always seemed to run away from him. He'd been born in Kentucky, the son of a mother he loved, and an abusive, alcoholic father who grew to hate. The family moved whenever the military shipped the Greenwells off to another unknown place. The jarring rhythm took John from Tennessee to Texas, to California, to Germany, then finally to Alabama. By the time he finished high school in Huntsville, he had already lived many lives. He had been a good student, a Boy Scout, a member of the French Club, an actor in a film at school about acceptance, a graduate, a heterosexual. When he braved the cold and walked to the bus station on the edge of a dying downtown and put his dollar on the counter and found to see them greyhound headed east, he put that John Greenwell to death. John dreamed of being a hippie, of growing out his short brown hair, of life with people like him. He wanted to see the world through psychedelic eyes wanted to touch the bodies of gods. Mm. The bus rumbled to life, its air brake hissed and squealed as it pulled out of the station. Huntsville dimmed behind it as John's eyelids flickered. He fell asleep to the urban lullaby he'd learned in eighth grade, Matilda Clark's escape fantasy downtown. Downtown. The bus crossed an imaginary line in the dark and Alabama faded into Georgia. John woke for a moment, decided he would never go back and drifted off into the comfort of his dreams. Wet bus doors slapped open and woke John up in Atlanta as midnight grew near. He, wa <clears throat> he walked from the smartly styled Art Deco bus station toward a hotel down the street, paid $4 a night, tossed his briefcase on the bed in a small cold room, and headed out hungry for sex. He turned toward the Strip, Atlanta's Greenwich, Greenwich Village, its Haight-Ashbury. The Strip's grand houses had emptied out in hysteric fits of white flight. Those who had abandoned the city likened it to ruins. Gays and lesbians moved in promptly and called it home. Thousands arrived each year from Sumter, South Carolina, Op, Alabama, Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, and Tallahassee, Florida. They fashioned an oasis and all the animals emerged from the woods to drink from the same pool. Literary drag queens and unapologetically effeminate men, which women in leather jackets, Beautiful athletic gay men with beards and beautiful gay women with flowing hair and painted faces. The invisible and unpredictable and unknowable borders of a police state kept their oasis under glass. Atlanta Vice knew why homosexuals came to the city, especially in spring, when the dogwoods painted the city with white and pink petals, when the sweet gum trees began to build their prickly seed pods. John had only cruised a few city blocks toward the strip when a one-armed man called out from his car. He didn't say much, didn't need to. John ran back to his small cold room, grabbed his gray briefcase, raced back down the stairs and jumped in for the ride wherever the next moment would take him. The newly minted couple drove south to a house in a bad neighborhood where the stranger slept with a gun under his pillow. The stranger waved goodbye anonymously to John in front of Rich's department store the next morning. The ornate Temple of Commerce towered over an entire city block, so imposing Atlantans used it to locate themselves physically as well as socially. Margaret Mitchell had bought her dress for the Gone with the Wind premiere in 1939 there. Martin Luther King had integrated the store's lunch counter. Greta Scott King wore Rich's coat to Sweden when the Reverend accepted his Nobel Peace Prize. Rich's had an auditorium, a china store, its own post office. Shoppers could wander past the store for fashion with its hat bar and its wig salon, or the perfumery where Chanel No. 5 spritzed the air. They could smell the heady scent of yeasty breads and Lady Baltimore cakes and pecan pies that wafted from the bakery, 
Watch children cheer and cry as they rode snout-nosed and curly-tailed pink pig monorail overhead through the toy department, or taste the tangy dressing of the Magnolia Room Cafe's chicken salad. Shoppers from around the South made special trips to Atlanta to buy there. It was Oz compared to the Sears catalog store where John's mother had bought the scruffy overalls that followed him to Atlanta. John pushed his way through ornate brass and glass doors, found a friendly face at a counter and asked if Robert weren't there. A counter clerk pointed him to the shoe department and Robert looked up in mild shock. Never expected his young acquaintance to make a trip to the city or to call him by his name in public. They had met in a clandestine place in a clandestine time, but Robert had made a promise and he kept his word. He brought his stray home to his lover and they made John a bed on a couch. John Greenwell had been in Atlanta just one day, but Alabama had already fallen into the never again past. He had a place to sleep, a few dollars in his wallet. He had his freedom. It was nearly all he had now that life had started all over again after it had barely begun.